code. So there you go. So ladies and gentlemen, today on the show, I'm joined by the great Patrick McEwen. Patrick wrote this mind blowing book, The Oxygen Advantage, which I was recommended a couple of years ago, uh, which I, I found to be just a pretty insane look because to me, I mean, we always think about health in terms of diet, in terms of our sleep, in terms of movement, but never really in terms of our breathing. So I want to know, Patrick, how did, you know, you sort of get interested in this stuff? What's your sort of background in this area? Yeah, like it was totally by accident. I had breathing issues myself, just as most people fall into this field. Um, I did an economics degree in a university in Dublin, Trinity College in Dublin. And all throughout my teenage years, going to secondary school, going to university, I had asthma, but I was tired all the time as well. And I never realized that breathing through an open mouth during sleep, I was snoring. And uh, I was also told that I stopped breathing. And I was waking up feeling exhausted. And I was a mouth breather during the day. And I was probably more of a mouth breather because my nose was constantly stuffy. And that's normal enough when you have asthma. Because if you have a problem with your lungs, it travels up to your nose. And then you're, you're tired with that. And if you're tired, of course, your concentration is impacted. Your focus is impacted. Memory. Um, ability to get grades because you know if you wake up feeling with a poor sleep you, you wake up feeling lousy and we're sending kids into school demanding that these kids get good grades without paying any consideration to their sleep and any consideration to their breathing so joe i came across it by accident i applied it for my own health i was never going to work in this field i remember going into my father-in-law and i said i'm really interested in this i think i'd like to make it as a career and i think he went white that's been honest with you. <laughs> because he was only beginning to think what was his daughter going to be doing marrying a waster like me who were teaching breathing exercise so you know sometimes your intuition is important sometimes you have to follow it and sometimes you have to don't pay any attention to what anybody else is saying but follow your gut and it really i have to say 20 years on I wake up and I often say to myself, I'm so fortunate. I have a job that is really suited to my own skills. And I love the field. I love the field. I've just written a book as we spoke about, you know, um, I had 1200 hours of work was what I've kind of tallied up for the book, you know, and 1200 hours that you're putting into a book and it's effortless and it's lovely to see it come to fruition. So yeah, it's wonderful work. And that's why I trained back in 2002 and I started working with people with asthma, then people with sleep disorder, breathing, snoring and sleep apnea. A lot of anxiety and panic disorder following the economic crash. You know, with people coming in with mindfulness and people, I brought mindfulness and functional breathing together because I keep thinking that mindfulness is wonderful, but it originated two and a half thousand years ago. And times have moved on. And mindfulness is not going to address dysfunctional breathing patterns. So if you have 75% of the anxiety population with dysfunctional breathing, and all it means, Joe, is that their breathing is a little bit fast, a little bit hard, a little bit upper chest, or they may have irregular breathing patterns, but that's feeding into their anxiety. And we can do all of the mindfulness under the sun. We can do all of the cognitive behavioral therapy under the sun. But unless we look at breathing and unless we look at sleep, there's two major parts of the puzzle being overlooked here. So, yeah, so roll on eight books later and, you know, it's my full time occupation and we've got a good support team and it's really, really good. So, yeah, I've made a career out of breathing. So it's been great. I love that, man. And it was interesting for me because a couple of years ago, my co-host, Lewis, he recommended this book to me. And I remember I was sat in in the car with him and he said, look, he said, there's this book. And he said, and I, and I think that I've been breathing wrong. And, and I looked sure. at him as if he had two heads. I said, two how, heads, how, yeah. how could you be breathing wrong? I, I said, how, how could we have evolved to breathe wrong? He said, honestly, he said, I'm not going to say, he said, just read this book. And I read this book yeah. and I thought, like, what on earth? So, so why isn't like this stuff more talked about? Why isn't this more known? Um. There was a really good chest physician in Cambridge Hospital, Papridge Hospital in Cambridge in the UK back in the 1960s. His name was Dr. Claude Lum. And he was prolific about addressing chronic hyperventilation syndrome in his patients. In other words, his patients coming in with chest pain, 
and different conditions, he would work to have them slow down their breathing. And he wrote a lot about it at the time. And he also wrote that part of the reason that this hasn't been embraced in healthcare is because medical doctors said it wasn't their field. And they handed it over to psychiatry. And psychiatry said it wasn't their field, so they handed it back to the medical doctors. And it fell between the two stools of medicine and psychiatry. And then if we look at how breathing is taught, there's a lot of nonsense out there about breathing. There really, really is. People are teaching breathing and they don't understand the basic physiology of it. And, you know, even just the Bohr effect, which was discovered back in 1904, that carbon dioxide plays a fundamental role in the blood because it's carbon dioxide that is a catalyst or unlocks oxygen from the red blood cells so that oxygen can be delivered to tissues and organs. Like, I'll give you an example. I always use the example, I was going for, I was going in to do a finals exam and I was, I was anxious as hell about it. And I went for a walk for about four minutes before the exam, just to clear my head. And I had all of these ideas, listening to everybody about breathing, you know, take full breaths and breathe more air and take a deep breath. And for four minutes, I took these full big breaths and I walked into the exam hall and I was totally spaced out, completely lightheaded. I never realized that the more air I breathed, it was depriving my brain of oxygen and blood flow. And that's what happens. So we have to consider that yes, oxygen and carbon dioxide, um, both are very important gases. And when we take a breath of air into our lungs, oxygen transfers from the lungs into the blood. And 98% of oxygen in the blood is carried by hemoglobin, which is a protein within the red blood cell. But hemoglobin releases oxygen in the presence of carbon dioxide. But if we have an idea, if we go to a studio and the instructor is telling us to take full breaths and we're hearing everybody in the class, we're hearing their breathing. The class is over breathing. They're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. Hemoglobin is holding on to oxygen more readily. So what the instructor is unknowingly doing is teaching these people how to reduce oxygen delivery to their tissues and organs. And in a class, it might be only for 30 minutes or 40 minutes or an hour. But what if these people then have a belief that when they go out into their everyday life, that it's beneficial to be taking these full big breaths? And yeah, so maybe the question then comes up, well, should we be breathing deep? What is a deep breath? A deep breath just means that you have lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs, that it's driven by the diaphragm. But you should never hear a breath during rest. So if you're doing yoga or if you're doing Pilates, if you're, if you're doing any breathing instruction, do everything that you're doing, but do it with silent breathing. And that way you can tap into the biomechanics of breathing, but also the biochemistry. So it's just three dimensions to breathing patterns. And the first one that I would always look at is the biochemistry. And that's about the volume of air that we breathe because it's the volume of air that we breathe per minute that determines the carbon dioxide in the lungs, that determines the carbon dioxide in the blood. So we need to have normal minute ventilation. We don't want to be under breathing, but we don't want to be over breathing. So we always focus on the biochemistry and the nose is of course the foundation, regardless of whatever dimension that you're looking at. And then we go from the biochemistry to the biomechanics, teaching people to breathe low, but also conserving their biochemistry. And then another aspect of breathing, which has really moved on in the last 30 years is resonance frequency breathing or coherent breathing or cadence breathing. And this is amazing that when we slow down the respiratory rate to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute, per minute, it stimulates the vagus nerve and it increases the sensitivity of the baroreceptors and baroreceptors are pressure receptors in the major blood vessels. And we need our baroreceptors to be highly sensitive to fluctuations in blood pressure. It's a really, the sensitivity of the baroreceptors is a really important indicator of the health of the autonomic or the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. Mm. So, you know, many athletes now are tracking their heart rate variability. They're tracking it during their sleep because heart rate variability is a clinical and objective measurement of stress in the human being. So say, for instance, you have a listener and your listener is in the corporate world and they feel stressed, but they, they're not quite sure because it's kind of subjective, the feeling of stress. 
And sometimes we kind of learn to live with that feeling. But with heart rate variability, we get an objective measurement of the, the impact that that stress is having on the human body. And the whole thing about breathing is that stress makes people sick. There's no question about that. And really what we need to be doing is to improve our heart rate variability and we can do it by different breathing exercises. So pretty much all of the exercise that we do in the Oxygen Advantage are targeting to improve heart rate variability. We, we improve heart rate variability during sleep, during um, simple breathing exercise involving breathing less air, you know, most people will have breathing exercise, breathing more air. We have some breathing exercises, breathing less air um, and subjecting the person to the feeling of air hunger to reduce the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. So I suppose, Joe, in a nutshell, breathing is simple and it's not so simple. Um, but when we look at the application of breathing exercises, any individual who is either physically or, or emotionally, emotionally unwell, they typically have low heart rate variability. And it's through the breath that we can influence the autonomic nervous system and we can achieve a better balance. And that's where we want to be. We want to have a balance between the, the rest and digest response, the parasympathetic nervous system and the fight and flight, the sympathetic nervous system. And we can achieve that through the breath. And that's all about resilience. And your listeners, they'll want resilience. They will want recovery. And Resilience is also an indicator of a person's ability to handle stress. And I remember as I was in Uppsala University for one year, I did an Erasmus exchange back in 1994. And I was working in an Irish bar, I was a dishwasher. And I remember, you know, this was just trying to, because Sweden was very expensive at the time. And, you know, you're trying to raise a few bob to cover, cover your fees and things. And I remember one chef would be coming in and uh, this chef was really wonderful. The meal tickets would come in and the chef was so focused and the meals were, were delivered and put out on time and everybody was happy and things would run fairly smoothly. And then there was another chef that would come in and they were about the same age. They were early 30s, two males, the same training, and they had so many things in common. But the second chef would come in and the place would fall asunder. And I, I often wondered at the time, because, of course, when you're in the dishwasher, you, you're the receiving end. If the, if the chef is in a good mood, you know about it. But if the chef is in a bad mood, you know about it. So I was there one, because I'm kind of you have a bird's eye view into it. Why can one chef, why can they deliver and the other one can't, despite so many, many similarities in training? And of course, the conclusion has to be that the degree to which the first chef is able to cope with stress, but not to get distracted and also to keep their attention in present moment awareness, to focus on the job at hand, as opposed to having so much of their attention stuck in their head. And I was one of those individuals. You know, my attention was always stuck in my head because we are trained how to think. We're trained how to analyze we're trained how to break information into tiny pieces, how to reason. We are trained how to think, but we are not trained how to stop thinking. We are not trained how to bring a calmness and a stillness to the mind. Our education system has fundamentally let us down. And it really, really has in so many different ways, forcing information down children's necks and not considering these children's breathing, not considering their sleep, and many of the, the, you know, the topics that would be so vital, because if I was asked, what would you trade a degree which I had to work so hard for or the ability to bring stillness to my mind, to concentrate and focus, I would choose the ability to bring a stillness to my mind. It has done more for me in the past 20 years. You're more intuitive. You're more creative. You have a better concentration. You've got a better ability to handle stress. You're happier because when we're stuck in our head all the time, living in thought, and most of Western society is in that way. When we're stuck in our heads, 90% of the, the thought activity is often negative and it's self-critical and it's driving up anxiety, driving up worries, and it makes us feel unhappy. And why on earth has education missed this one? They have. Man, so much in there. I completely agree with what you just said about the sort of flaws with the education system and, and about how it's just not taking these 
fundamental things into account. I want to um, sort of just start off at say the thirty thousand uh, foot view, just in terms of breathing. What you know, some of the stuff you talk about in this book. So I think a lot of people listening to this now, because I mean, I find this such a mind blowing concept. I've been involved in this, I've been running this podcast for three years, and I had never even heard of most of this stuff. So I would love to sort of bring this to our audience. Um, I never knew that there was a difference between breathing in air nasally versus through the mouth. So could you please talk about how, you know, those things differ? I know you talk about in the book that the mouth is made for eating. I, you know, I'd never considered some of this stuff. So could you talk about the difference between nose breathing and mouth breathing? Yeah, and Joe, and you're not the only one that doesn't consider it. The medical doctor doesn't consider it. <laughs> I, I was at a conference in Chicago and we had a debate going on in, in a medical conference with doctors saying that it didn't matter whether you breathe it through your mouth or nose. And I said to the medical doctor, I said, what does the mouth do in terms of breathing? Nothing. Zero. If you look at the human mouth, if you take air in through your mouth, that air goes straight down your throat. You have no filtering mechanism. You have no moistening. You have no warming. You have no regulating volume. You have no harnessing nasal nitric oxide. The nose and the nasal cavity is connected very much to the brain. So it's been shown in the latter years that memory increases when you breathe through your nose versus breathing through your mouth. So, you know, the nose is also connected to the diaphragm breathing muscle. So when we breathe, for example, through an open mouth, we tend to breathe faster in upper chest and faster in upper chest breathing puts the body into a fight or flight response. Mm. So mouth breathers are going to be having agitation of the mind. It's known that, you know, since March of 2017, Stanford Medical School, they identified a new structure in the brain. They first identified it in mice. And they said that this structure is spying on your breathing. And it's reporting its findings to another structure in the brain called the locus corollis. And if you breathe fast, this structure is, the locus corollis is relaying signals of agitation to the rest of the brain and also more likely to wake you from sleep. So fast breathing and upper chest breathing, because of course the diaphragm breathing muscle is also connected with the emotions. Now your nose slows down breathing and nasal breathing since 1988 has been shown to improve the pressure of oxygen in the blood by 10%. Now, not everybody breathes through their mouth all of the time, but if you were to go to a gym whenever they open again, you would see that about 90% of people will be open mouth breathing even during moderate, moderate physical exercise. Why would you do physical exercise with your mouth open? Number one is, it's reducing oxygen transfer from the blood, from the lungs to the blood. It's reducing carbon dioxide. And as a result, you don't get as good oxygen delivery to tissues. It's trauma to the upper airways. You're not activating the diaphragm to the same extent. And the diaphragm breathing muscle and functional movement of the diaphragm, whereby the diaphragm is allowed to move back to its resting position following an exhalation, during an exhalation. That generates what's called intra-abdominal pressure. That you can imagine a weightlifter and a weightlifter is going to lift a weight. And normally when you lift a weight, you hold your breath. So they breathe in and hold their breath because mm. as they're lifting the weight, they take a breath in, the diaphragm is moving downwards. And it's almost that the, the abdomen becomes like a pneumatic balloon providing stabilization for the spine. So our diaphragm breathing muscle is very important for the support and for posture and for you know, stabilization of the spine and also the relationship between diaphragm breathing and functional movement. In one paper by Bradley published in 2014, 87.5% of individuals who passed the functional movement screen, I know it has its critics, but you could use any functional movement screen, but 87.5% of these individuals were classified as diaphragmatic breathers. And when you look at the relationship it, over the last 10 years, there's a greater awareness that if breathing is not functional, movement is not functional. And if movement is not functional, we're at a greater risk of injury. And to tie in with that, 50% of individuals with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing patterns, 50%. <laughs> but we need that dive from breathing muscle, not just for respiration, but also for the function of stability and postural control. Man, this, this, I find this absolutely mind blowing stuff. So I want to double click on some of those ideas, but there, so just in terms of um, mouth breathing, uh, yes. I suppose, why do people um, 
become mouse breeders. I know in the book you, you'd say that um, if you went back in time, pe- you know, people didn't have crooked teeth. They had these wide mm. jaws. But for some reason, you know, ev- evolutionary, you know, the modern lifestyle, our jaws have become smaller and weaker. Our teeth are becoming crooked. So what are, you know, why have people become mouth breathers and what are the negative effects of mouth breathing? It's very difficult to say, is there one thing that causes mouth breathing? But even if you were to just to look at a book written back in the 1930s called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, and it was written by a Western Price. And he looked at, he looked at children, first generation children off the Hebrid, on the Hebride Islands. I think it's off the coast of Scotland. And these children, these, the people living on the Hebrides, they were eating traditional food for thousands of years, fish, oatmeal. And then commerce started coming to the island, bringing chocolate and marmalade and sugars. And first generation children became mouth breeders. But also, if you are a child with your mouth open, your tongue isn't resting in the roof of the mouth. And if your tongue isn't resting in the roof of the mouth, the pressure is exerted by the lips and the cheeks force the mouth they force the jaws to grow incorrectly so in other words we need the tongue to be resting in the roof of the mouth because it's the pressures exerted by the tongue which assists in the craniofacial development so the lower half of the face is influenced by whether you have your mouth open or closed during childhood now if the mouth we know 25 to 50 percent of study children persistently mouth breed that's that's what many many studies are showing And, you know, so that's one aspect of it is nutrition. Another aspect could be asthma. You know, if you look at the instance of asthma in the UK, it's about 10% of the population. Um, And if you have asthma, if you have inflammation of your lungs, it travels up to your nose. And if your nose is stuffy, of course, you're not going to breathe through it. You're going to breathe through your mouth. Uh, Lack of breastfeeding, um, because breastfeeding is not just about nutrition, but it's also about manipulation of the muscles of the face necessary for craniofacial development eating soft foods you know we're eating Mm. soft foods now whereas by our ancestors were eating hard foods and that was helping to develop strong jaws yeah so there's many factors with it now the the industries really need to so you know i'm lucky enough and that i don't have a dental license and i don't have a medical license and I can put information about breathing and the impact without a dental board coming down on top of me. <laughs> because I'll give you an example. Dr. John Mew is 91 years of age and he's in the, he's in the United Kingdom. He's based in Purley. And for 40 years, he, he's a dentist. His father was a dentist. He's an orthodontist. He also trained as an orthodontic surgeon. And he noticed that children coming in with jaws set back, So say, for instance, the maxilla is set back, the mandible is set back. These children have high upper palates. They have overcrowding of teeth. They have a compromised airway. He said, what's going on here? He wasn't just an orthodontist that's going to take your five or six thousand pounds and straighten your teeth and off you go. He's more concerned with the shape of the face and the development of the airway. And he spoke about this for decades and his peers ridiculed him. But now it's starting to come to fruition. And what's gone viral is a concept called mewing, M-E-W-I-N-G. So John Mew, um, he's still, you know, I, he's retired now, but he's involved in terms of um, communication on different forums and groups, etc. And his son, Mike Mew, is an orthodontist who is continuing the work. The in, this, is, this, like, this information has been around for 100 years, and that's what I find really frustrating that we have highly intelligent people armed with medical degrees who have failed our children and failed those children who are mouth breathing. And I write about, you know, 1909 published in the Dental Cosmos at the time. There's an article in it and you'll find this online. And it talked about the child, the mouth breathing child in school, dull and expressionless face, inattentive in class, not able to concentrate, The teacher is accusing the child of daydreaming because these children are exhausted. Exhausted, And Karen Bonnock did a study of 11,000 children in Stratford-upon-Avon. It was published in the journal Pediatrics in 2012. She looked at children with sleep disorder breathing, which just includes snoring. No child should snore. And children who were untreated by age five, they had a 40% risk of special education needs by age eight. 
Now, now we're going on to something. And when I was in Bordeaux in France in 2016, I was giving a talk and there was a doctor there called Dr. Christian Guimeno. And he's considered the founding father or one of them of sleep medicine. He coined the phrase obstructive sleep apnea. He developed the apnea hypopnea index. And I remember him standing up and he said, we need engineers. We need all of these different. We need pilots. We need all of these professions. And I quote him, he said, children's brains are getting fried because children, because of the poor sleep quality, it's not just that these kids are waking up tired. It's not just that these kids can be labeled as having ADHD, but the brain is developing during those formative years. And in order for good development, cognitive development, you need good quality sleep. And it's being overlooked. In 20 years, nobody told me to breathe through my nose. I had to read it from a newspaper article. And, you know, many of your listeners are going to have children. Many of your listeners are waking up at a dry mouth in the morning. I would say 50% of the adult population breeds through an open mouth during sleep. And I will guarantee you that many of your listeners who wake up at a dry mouth in the morning, they're not waking up feeling refreshed. They're more likely to snore. They're more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea. They're more likely to have interrupted sleep. They're getting up to go to the bathroom during the middle of the night. They've got dry mouths. They've got increased risk of bad breath, increased dental health issues because of the dry mouth, gum disease, even chapped lips. You know, chapped lips is something that only happens if you breathe through an open mouth. If you breathe through your nose, you don't get chapped lips because chapped lips is caused by the drying, taking that cold, dry air across the lips. It dries out the lips and then you lick the lips and then they become chapped. So, you know, that's just one aspect, but the, the human nose is responsible for up to 30 functions in the human body. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that if one is mouth breathing, they don't reach their full potential. Um, this is a, this is absolutely mind blowing stuff. Um, I would just, just throw one question out there to you. I mean, just, just since we're on this topic, which is just blowing these things in my mind, is it possible that men and women could breathe differently? Yes. And this has been known since 1905. But uh, because most of the research was done by men, they failed to realize that, of course, women breathe differently to men. And it's, it's mainly with younger females during the, the monthly cycle. Um, so days post-ovulation, days 10 to days 22, it's during the luteal phase. There's an increase in a hormone called progesterone. And progesterone is a respiratory stimulant. So it will make breathing being slightly faster and harder. So the female is breathing faster and harder during this time because of the, this, the increased respiration due to um, change of hormones, the increase in progesterone. And this causes carbon dioxide levels to drop by as much as 25%. Now, this is huge because carbon dioxide in the blood shouldn't vary by more than three millimeters of mercury no matter what activity you're doing, whether it's rest or physical exercise or sleep. And for carbon dioxide levels to drop at 25% is significant. So say, for example, if you have an individual with normal carbon dioxide in the blood of 40 millimeters of mercury, and if you have a drop of 10 millimeters of mercury down to 30, mm -hmm. every one millimeter drop of mercury pressure reduces blood flow to the brain by 2%. And that's known since the 1980s. So, it, you know, a significant drop, you could have a 20% reduction in blood flow to the brain, but also the faster and harder breathing, it arouses the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. It causes increased neuronal excitability. So the brain cells are more excited. There's hyperexcitability. There's increased pain perception and there's reduced pain thresholds. There's increased feeling of anxiety and panic and fatigue, and those symptoms which often will coincide with PMS. PMS and hyperventilation also can go hand in hand. Now, this won't affect all females all the same because females, just, just as men do, breathe differently. Mm. One person can breathe differently to another. But if you have a female with relatively poor breathing, then when there's a change of hormones on top of the already poor breathing, this will be when I would expect the female to have increased symptoms. And, you know, if that female starts breathing through the nose, starts slowing down their breathing, starts breathing lightly, starts breathing low. And I use the acronym 
LSD. So L is for light, S is for slow, and D is for deep. And light breathing is about the biochemistry. Slow breathing is about coherent breathing or resonance frequency. And deep breathing is about using the diaphragm. But the foundation to that is breathing in and out through the nose. So females really are more susceptible to changes. They, they're more likely to have changes in breathing. And there is no question that performance is going to suffer during that time. So you've got one to two weeks of every month that performance is not going to be what it would be ordinarily. And that should be taken into consideration. You know, females doing exams, females competing in different, um, whatever they're competing in. And because if you, if you don't have the focus, if, you, if you're feeling anxious, um, if you're more likely to have, say, panic disorder, which females are more prone to, temperament, or joint pain is influenced by changes in the monthly cycle. And then females, postmenopausal women, their risk of sleep disorder breathing increases by 300%. And anecdotally, we have seen, because there's no research in this, in terms of the changes of breathing with postmenopausal, we know that sleep disorder breathing increases 300%. The research is there on that. But only anecdotal evidence do we have that when women then breathe through their nose during sleep, that they have a reduction of hot flashes or hot flushes. So, you know, 50% of your listeners are likely to be female. And many of them will not have considered the, the change of hormones and the influence that has on their breathing and how they feel. Man, one, one thing which has come up today a lot, I know that you sort of discussed it, it's, it's in the book as well, is this idea of sort of over breathing, which I mean, you know, to, I suppose to the person listening to this, I mean, they'd be thinking too much air, how can I breathe in too much air, it's keeping me alive. So could you sort of double click on this? Cause I find this just a, a crazy concept. Sure. So, if we were to look at normal physiological norms, um, the volume of air that we should breathe in in one minute during rest is between four to six liters. And that's normally about 10 to 12 breaths. And each breath is a half a liter. So four to six liters of air. Now, if we were to look at a study involving asthma back in 1994, involving the Buteco method, all asthmatics, both in the Buteco group and in the control group, they were breathing 14.1 litres every minute, every hour, every day. Normal breathing is four to six litres. And here you have our group of asthmatics breathing 14 litres. And I'm not just saying this is not just a once-off. This is that the asthma population, because of narrowing of the lungs, they feel they're not getting enough air. And as a result, they breathe harder and faster to try and eliminate the feeling of suffocation and they develop a habit of overbreathing, which in turn, their airways are not able to cope with. It's causing their airways to cool, their airways to dry out, moisture is being sucked out of the airways, carbon dioxide is being lost from the blood, and their airways narrow in response to this. So the interesting thing about asthma is that the condition feeds in in itself. If you have asthma, your airways narrow. If your airways narrow, you feel you're not getting enough air. If you're not getting enough air, you breathe harder. If you breathe harder, your airways narrow, and it's a vicious cycle, but not just with that group. Look at people with anxiety. So they undergo, say, for example, a period of stress in their life, as we all can. But if the stress is prolonged, we breathe harder and faster and upper chest breathing through that time. The body develops a habit of breathing harder and faster and upper chest breathing. And even when the stress is removed, the poor breathing pattern continues. And that poor breathing pattern is going to continue and feed back into stress. In other words, we develop a habit of overbreathing, just the same as we can develop a habit of overeating. Now, what impact does it have? Number one, if you breathe more air than what the body requires, you don't increase blood oxygen saturation. Because during normal volume breathing, it's already almost fully saturated, between 95 to 99%, the SpO2 or SaO2. So there's no benefit in terms of increased oxygenation from breathing more air. But breathing more air is going to get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. And as I said, carbon dioxide is not just that waste gas. It's very, important, it's very common for people with dysfunctional breathing to have cold hands and cold feet. I had cold hands. And we, we seldom realize that carbon dioxide is what's called a vasodilator. 
that if you're breathing too hard and you get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs, your blood vessels constrict. So you, we have 70,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the body who are, which are prone to constriction due to over breathing. Another aspect then is of course the Bohr effect which we touched on earlier. Too low CO2 in the blood that the bond between hemoglobin, which is the carrier of oxygen in the blood, hemoglobin holds on to oxygen more readily when CO2 is low. So it's ironic, Joe. If I said to somebody to start breathing hard for 20 or 30 breaths, they might have a belief in their head that it's increasing oxygen delivery to the brain. And the opposite is going to be happening. Their blood vessels are constricting. It's activating a fight or flight sympathetic tone, sympathetic reaction. And there's less oxygen due to what's called the left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So any of your listeners, if they're any kind of into science, just go into YouTube and just put in oxygen dissociation curve. And you'll see that when there's a, when there's a drop to carbon dioxide, there's an increase to blood pH, the curve shifts to the left and the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen becomes stronger. Now, there's no point in bringing air into the, into the lungs and for oxygen to pass into the blood and to be carried around the body and to breathe that oxygen back out again. It's not about the amount of oxygen in the blood, but it's about getting that oxygen from the blood to where it's needed. And that's where normal minute ventilation is, is important. So like I'd say to your listeners is, you know, if you're sitting at home and you're kind of just relax and pay attention to your breathing, and follow the slightly colder air coming into your nose and the slightly warmer air as it leaves your nose. And as you're breathing, gently start slowing down the speed of the air as it enters and it leaves your nostrils. Slow down your breathing to the point that you feel hardly any air coming in and out of your nose. So take a very soft, gentle breath in through your nose and at the top of the breath, allow a really relaxed and a prolonged and gentle exhalation. Keep focusing on the airflow coming into the nose Breathe so softly, almost as if you're hardly breathing at all. Breathe so softly that the fine hairs within the nostrils do not move. Now, during that time, because your breathing is soft and light and slow, you're going to be breathing less air than what you ordinarily will breathe. Because you breathe less air, carbon dioxide is increasing slightly in the blood. And carbon dioxide is the primary stimulus to breathe. So when carbon dioxide increases in the blood, you're going to feel that you're not getting enough air. So during that exercise, you're gonna feel slightly suffocated. You're gonna feel air hunger, but that's only telling you that carbon dioxide has increased in the blood. And the ironic thing is, even though you're feeling air hunger during the exercise, your blood vessels are dilating and there's increased oxygen delivery to tissues and cells. So it's really, about the breath, it's almost that we have to do completely turn it on, turn it on its head. And, you know, that's just looking at the biochemistry of breathing. And then we do exercise in terms of the biomechanics. Then we do resonance frequency breathing. And then we do, so that, that, that aspect is functional breathing patterns. And we're looking at, the other point that I'd like to make is that it's not just how you breathe inside of a studio. You can imagine the hundreds of thousands of people that are doing yoga, they're doing Pilates, they're doing all of these wonderful modalities. They're learning breathing techniques inside the studio, but they're not carrying these breathing techniques outside of the studio. If I have somebody with me, it's not just about how I teach them in here. How do they breathe when they leave? I need to get their mouths closed. 20 years ago, I started taping my mouth closed at night. It was the best night's sleep ever. And we've had thousands of people tape their mouths, thousands. And like, I'll show you a tape as well. Yeah, I'm curious to see this. There's a couple of different options. Like traditionally, this is what I was using, 3M one inch micropore, but people with anxiety get anxious about it. And we had a problem with children because we really needed children to switch to nasal breathing, but taping them up was out, you know, obviously without risk, but we had some risk to it. So we brought out a tape called myotape <laughs> and we, we brought it out because of dentistry but this is the adults one here and i'll kind of just show it to you 
It was for because children who undergo orthodontic treatment, more so it's known about it in the United States, but if the child continue mouth breathing post orthodontic treatment, there's a 65% relapse. Mm. So if children undergo orthodontic treatment, we also need to improve their functional breathing habits. And with myofunctional therapy, um, that these children then have a better, they have a better long-term outcome. So this is myotape. And um, so I'll just take off a strip of it here. And it's kinesio tape that's cut and it's cotton and the glue is altered. And what it's doing is because it's the tension is going bi-directional. So it's activating muscle here as the orbicularis oris muscle to help improve muscle tone and function. But it's also bringing the lips together. But if say, for instance, a child had to, you know, whatever reason have to open their mouth, they can do. But at the same time, this tension is sufficient to ensure nasal breathing. And we also use it as a training tool for children because children when they're often watching television they're kind of watching television and the mouth is open so we have them wear the tape for periods of 40 minutes a day maybe 60 minutes a day if they're watching a movie or something like that and it's really just to connect, get the connection between nose breathing and the brain that the brain associates that the only way to breathe for the child and also for the adult is to breathe in and out through the nose so so that's functional breathing and sleep is really important and getting your mouth closed. And, you know, if you are waking up with a dry mouth in the morning, try it without the tape. But if you continue waking up with a dry mouth in the morning, what I'd say is, you know, it's $25, about 18 pounds for three months. So six pound a month. And I guarantee you, if you get your mouth closed during sleep, for many of you, it'll make a big, big difference. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, can I just jump in there, just just interject, just ask? And I assume that if that is sort of putting some tension on your mouth, um, no more air is coming through your nose. And I assume that that would also improve snoring. It's yeah, good question. Um, the wearing the tape at, at night with the tension around the mouth isn't going to necessarily open up the nose, but the nose will open up just by breathing through it. Mm. So the wonderful thing about the human nose is that you can open it by breathing through it. But there are exercises to decongest the nose. Oh, interesting. So if any of your listeners have a stuffy nose, and maybe if you want to give it a go yourself there, yeah. um, just a precaution would be don't do it if you're pregnant. Um, don't do it if your listeners have any kind of serious medical conditions. But to open up the nose, you have to hold your breath for at least 30 seconds. That's the key. <laughs> so to do this, take a normal breath in through your nose and a normal breath out through your nose. And then you pinch your nose and you just gently nod your head up and down, holding your breath. And you keep on holding your breath for as long as you can. Keep holding your breath. Keep nodding your head up and down, holding your breath. Or you could do it walking around and keep doing it for as long as you can. Then let go, but breathe in through your nose. And then breathe normally for about a minute. Do it again. And if you do it five or six times, hay fever, stuffiness of the nose, you'll find that it will bring ease. And... The question then about snoring is, so say for instance, it's common that people snore through an open mouth and it goes a bit like this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> then I say, to the, I say to the students, I said, now what I want you to do is, I want you to close your mouth and try and snore through your mouth. So they close their mouths. You can't snore through your mouth, obviously, if your mouth is closed, okay? So mouth snoring stops once we get the mouth closed using the tape. No snoring goes a bit like this. But now what I say to the students is, now what I'd like you to do is really slow down your breathing. So slow down the speed of the air coming into your nose and then have a really relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out and a very soft and slow, gentle breath in and a really relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. And when you breathe slowly, try and snore. And you'll see that it's much more difficult. You can still snore when you breathe slowly, especially if you have a nose like mine that's totally compromised. The septum is, nose is all over the place. So you can still snore, but it's much, much less. So snoring, you know, if we were to look at snoring, generally what's blamed is the anatomy, that the airway is compromised. 
but no engineer would look at a tube without considering flow. And if you have somebody with slightly faster and harder breathing, that faster and harder breathing through a narrow tube, the airway, is going to increase turbulence and turbulence is what's causing snoring. But not only snoring can be significantly alleviated, so can obstructive sleep apnea. Now, this is a condition that we should all be aware of. Um, and 90% 90 90 of individuals will always say is undiagnosed. Like if you hear of a 40 year old dying because of a heart problem or dying in their sleep, I would always suspect that they had a sleep problem because what's happening is that they are asleep and they stop breathing during sleep due to collapse of the upper airways. So the throat can collapse or the tongue falls into the throat or the epiglottis falls into the throat. And as they stop breathing during sleep, their blood oxygen saturation drops and their carbon dioxide increases. And then they resume breathing with gasping and panting. And then they stop breathing again, but it puts an enormous pressure on the heart. It really hugely puts a huge pressure on the heart. And uh, it's linked with diabetes, it's also linked with dementia, it's linked with fibromyalgia. So if you were to put in obstructive sleep apnea, you'll see that there's a host of different conditions because of the stress impact. And also the individual isn't having a good recovery. They're not having a good sleep. It's related to 20% of road traffic accidents is related to driver fatigue. And not just that, like I used to fly a lot because of before COVID and I'd be flying continuously and pilots falling asleep, you know, and it, I put a new thing in or put a section into small, just a few paragraphs into the book. And it was a survey conducted by the British Pilots Association of the pilots falling asleep. And I think it's the figure, I can't remember totally correctly, but 30% of pilots, they would wake up in mid-flight to look at their co-pilot asleep. So in other words, the flight was completely just, well, obviously it's going on autopilot anyway, which is probably okay. But I'd like to think that the person up in the cockpit is awake at the same time, you know? <laughs> so sleep, sleep can be, you know, it can be very important for safe productivity, but also for health. But 26% of men less than 50 years of age are risk of sleep apnea, 26%, one in four. And even in sports, the big guys. So any man with a, an extra conference more than 16 inches, 17 inches, they're at a greater risk of sleep apnea. Rugby guys, rugby players, weightlifters. And for men over 50 years of age, it increases to 43%, one in two. And when you're talking about weight gain, so if you have an individual who is having sleep apnea, it's having such a disruption of their nervous system and hormones can be affected. One hormone is leptin, the other hormone ghrelin. So it increases ghrelin, which in turn stimulates their appetite. They eat more food, they put more weight in the belly. Putting weight in the belly impinges the movement of the diaphragm. This reduces lung volume. This in turn, then the throat is more likely to collapse. So it's a vicious circle. So yeah, so it's, it's you know, there's interesting the connection. And I wrote an article, a scientific article with two medical doctors and we've just submitted it's it's up for peer review now looking at the application of breathing re-education for sleep disorder breathing including sleep apnea and this is the first time you know because the thing about breathing is that it doesn't promise profit nobody's going to there's no lucrative return from it you know you could have a breathing therapist who's going to make a living from it you can sell a few books of course and that's all great but unfortunately research it doesn't command research because you know even if it shows that it's beneficial who's going to teach it and it takes time and it's so much easier just to do research on a product produce the product make millions of dollars and that's what it's all about and that's unfortunate and at the same time i have to say it has completely changed um you know, sleep and energy levels for me over the last 20 years. And God only knows, even though, of course, you're not going to have perfect night's sleep every night of the week. That's normal. But it's still a hell of a lot better than what it would have been. Man, I love this. I love this. I've just got two more questions for you just about uh, the content of this book. So mm -hmm. someone listening today, I mean, we've gone through nasal breathing. We've gone from over breathing. We've gone 30 times. We've gone through hormones, biochemistry. We've gone through so much. If someone's listening to this now, let's say that they are prone to anxiety, they're prone to panic attacks, they're in the middle of, say, a panic attack, or their body has gone into fight or flight, 
do you have any sort of um, uh, methodologies, any sort of breathing tips which you could give them in, say, the middle of a panic attack or to prevent <laughs> panic attacks? Yes. People with panic disorder tend to have dysfunctional breathing. It's very, very common. So in the literature, it's 75% of people with anxiety and panic disorder have dysfunctional breathing. Wow. With wow. panic disorder, there are two subsets, it seems. One group of people are able to cope with the feeling of air hunger or suffocation, but the other group of people are not. When they feel suffocation, it puts them into a fight or flight response and it will bring them into panic disorder. The issue about people prone to panic disorder is their everyday breathing is not good and they're teetering on the brink of symptoms. So if I look at the person coming in with panic disorder, they typically breathe faster, they breathe up her chest and they sigh. One sigh every few minutes is not a good sign because it's telling me that the person is, is fairly stressed out. Now, that's their everyday breathing. But then they go into a crowded place or they're driving their car or they're confronted by stress. They don't have the ability to cope well with that stress and they go into panic. Improve your everyday breathing first and foremost. That's the key. That will give you the better resilience and also to reduce your desensitize your body's reaction to the feeling of suffocation. Now, a good exercise just to start off, which would be easy enough for everybody is, first of all, breathe through your nose all the time, but do small breath holds and you'll find them up on YouTube. If you put in Patrick McKeown, stop asthma or stop panic attack, you'll see some of these exercises. Take an over breath in and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold and hold your nose for three to five seconds. Then let go, but breathe in through your nose. Breathe normal for 10 seconds. And then again, take a normal breath in and out through your nose and hold and hold for three to five seconds. Then let go, but breathe in through your nose and breathe normal for 10 seconds. Start off with that. It's giving you a little bit of a dose of the feeling of air hunger, and that will help desensitize your reaction to it. And it will also help to normalize CO2 in the blood. And, you know, there was a paper, a study conducted with a Dr. Moret. And she looked at individuals with panic disorder and she compared cognitive training to slow breathing. And she said that these people with panic disorder, they have a problem with their respiratory physiology. Cognitive training does not change respiratory physiology. But if you learn slow breathing, and when I talk about slow breathing, not to overbreed. So the person with panic disorder could also practice gently slowing down their breathing to feel air hunger, but don't do it too much to the point that you get panicked. So normally when I'm working with panic disorder, I'll have the individuals do it for about 30 seconds. I want to give them a teaspoon of the dose of air hunger because I've made plenty of mistakes with people with panic disorder. Um, I made plenty of mistakes over the years. So, you know, that's why it's, it's, it's a very gentle approach is important. We, we want to kind of expose the person to suffocation, but we don't want to put them into a panic attack. Now, if you're in the throes of a panic attack or for example, people recovering from COVID or people having asthma attack, there's a, a significant feeling of suffocation and a drive to breathe and that panic. And normally how people then respond is they breathe fast and shallow using the upper chest. And it's entirely the wrong way to breathe because it's fast breathing, shallow breathing, and it's wasting a lot of air to dead space. Much better would be just cup your hands in your face like this. And really breathe slowly in and out through your nose as you're cupping your hands. Now, this is much safer by cupping your hands across your face than a paper bag because a paper bag doesn't allow oxygen in. So the purpose of cupping the hands is to pull carbon dioxide, to rebreathe that carbon dioxide back into the lungs, to increase it in the blood, to increase blood flow to the brain to have a calming effect. And it's known that since 1924, that low CO2 causes brain cell excitability. And for example, people with other aspects with seizures, with epilepsy, you know, and it's not that every form of epilepsy is contributed to by hyperventilation, but some are. So for panic disorder, um, I would say improve everyday breathing patterns. And there is a breath toll time that you could use to give you some idea, it's called the Bolt score. And the BOLD score has been tested in a paper by Kiesel and published in 2018, a professor of physical therapy. He looked at 51 individuals 
And he concluded that if their breath hold time, their comfortable breath hold time, if it's less than 25, sorry, if it's greater than 25 seconds, there's an 89% chance that this functional breathing is not present. So that was his conclusion. So he, did, he, he carried out a study to come up with a screening protocol for, for dysfunctional breathing in, in the population. And it's pretty much the bold score. When you see it written in the paper, he talks about take a normal breath in and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold. And time, how long can you hold your breath for until you feel the first definite desire to breathe? And if it's greater than 25 seconds, there's an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing is not present. For people with asthma, for people with panic disorder, for people doing sports, it's very important because if you have a low breath hold time during rest, it's a measure of breathlessness during physical exercise. And you can imagine somebody with a breath hold time of 10 seconds, they get overtly breathless during physical exercise. And the other aspect, Joe, then is breath holding. You know, there's, there's also a role for breath holding to stress the body because we didn't really touch on that, but that could be another topic. And this is whereby we get individuals to stop breathing, do breath holding, say, for example, take a normal breath in and out through the nose and they hold their nose. And then we have them walk and jog and run holding the breath. And we push them to a strong air hunger. And the whole purpose of that is to lower blood oxygen saturation, increase carbon dioxide, disturb the blood acid base balance, and to improve the buffering capacity to increase, you know, um, delay, increase the buffering capacity to delay lactic acid and fatigue. So there's other aspects going. That's the one thing about breathing. The more you go into it, it's just, a fun, it's, the depth of it is phenomenal. You know, it really is. And the other, like, it really does have an impact on the major disciplines of medicine and dentistry. Um, and when we're talking about the breath, it's not just about normally the nonsense that's often taught out there. And it would be tremendous if people teaching breathing, if they understand the basic physiology and the interconnectedness and everyday breathing patterns and functional breathing, because they could do so much more to help their client population. And for sure. And for everybody wondering today, the book which we were discussing is The Oxygen Advantage. Uh, Patrick mentioned that he's just finished his latest book, The Breathing Cure. Do we have any idea when that will be released, when it'll hit the shelves? Yeah, it should hit the shelf in the February the 15th in the UK Amazing. and Ireland. Amazing. Yeah, because I've decided to take it on board myself. We've got publishers in the United States and it's going into about seven different languages so far. So it's double the size of the oxygen advantage. It's 190,000 words. And you know, if people think that there's not a whole lot in breathing, I say, have a look at this book and say. <laughs> Man, I love it. I love it. We always finish off these. I always ask, uh, what books have impacted your life, Patrick? My most favorite book that I have ever read that gave me the most throughout my life was The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And I came across that in Canada in 2000. And I was starting with my journey with the breath and quietening the mind. I was doing it. It was three years into it. And it was by accident that I found that book. And I read it so many different times. I even recorded it and I, on the cassette deck at the time, back in the, the early noughties. And when I was driving around, I used to play it back to myself. Wonderful book, The Power of Now. Highly recommend it. Um, many tremendous books, of course, that we read over, you know, over the years, but that's the one that always stands out. Definitely a great book. Man, I love this. And my last question for you today, question which we ask all our guests at the end, is what makes a life worth living? I think people need to have passion. I think we need to have a purpose in our life. And um, if one doesn't have purpose, it's a seed for mental health issues. And when one has purpose, you, it gives you some degree of fulfillment, but also there's the, there's the comfort in knowing that your, your life is worth living, you know, and I feel sorry for people that they're, you know, they're in roles that they hate. And I was in that in the corporate world as well. And sometimes, you know, when you're in a job that you absolutely hate and that increases anxiety and it's not ideal. You know, so it's time then, but I took, I bit the bullet and I got out of it. 
and I was working for an American multinational, which most people would be saying was, was a good job, but not with the pressures that was put upon me, etc. Um, but yeah, just to answer short is, yeah, we need purpose. We need something that, you know, that gives us some meaning in our own life. I completely agree. That was beautiful. Patrick, where can these guys connect with you? Um, we've got we've got social media channels. So Oxygen Advantage is all about kind of performance based and sports, etc. And you take a clinic is about health. So there's YouTube and there's Instagram and there's websites there and there's different workshops and things like that that we're doing all the time. So uh, the website then for the tape would be myotape.com. And uh, yeah, reach out on social media. Yeah, let them know, guys, that you enjoyed this interview. The book we discussed today was The Oxygen Advantage. The Breathing Cure is out February 15th. Patrick, man, this was such a pleasure. Man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks very much, Joe.